Welcome everyone to the worship for Sleaford Methodist Circuit. Last week there was no video and uh, next week there will be no video either. Uh, this is due to holidays and other things happening. But in fact, more than that, um, with other people's holidays and one thing and another, in August, we're just going to have one video right at the end of August. Um, as many of you watching this will already know, um, I, I am retiring at the end of August, uh, so I'll be stopping after that. So this is the penultimate of my worship videos and the sunlight comes out and ruins my exposure as I say that. Uh, sign from God, who knows. Um, this is the penultimate one uh, of, of these videos. I will be doing one more on the 27th of August uh, and that, that will be that will be it. Um, so I, I hope you've found these as helpful uh, as I've enjoyed actually making them. Um, but we're not quite finished yet. Uh, we're going to look at uh, today's lectionary reading, which is about uh, the kingdom of God. But first of all, a couple of prayers. And the first one really is written for a gathering of Christians in one place, in a church. Uh, but in another sense, we are a gathering of Christians. We are worshipping God. And although we are scattered in space and in time as well, we're not all doing this at the same time or in the same house, but we are still in one sense united. We're part of that fellowship of Christians um, who many of you are from the, uh, the Sleaford circuit and others perhaps joining us from further afield, but we're all united in Christ. A prayer um, about worship and then a, a prayer of confession. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power that created the world in which we live, but we thank you more for the love and the grace with which you sustain it and renew its life day by day. We rejoice to be here in your presence on this YouTube channel, gathered together. We remember how Jesus rejoiced to worship in the synagogue in his day. We remember how he cleared the temple so that all people there could worship you. Father, every time we think of you, we are filled with thankfulness. Every time we think of Jesus, we want to say thank you. Thank you that he came. Thank you that he comes. Thank you that he died. Thank you that he was raised again. Thank you that he has promised to be with us always. Thank you that through Jesus we have been enabled to really know you for the first time. Once you were just a name, someone in the Bible, now you are becoming more real to us each day. And may worshipping with you and with fellow Christians, the people of God, be as important to us as it was to Jesus. Hear our prayer in the name of him who gave you the glory. Amen. Lord, we confess that we pay lip service to the values of your kingdom. We love those who love us, but we find it impossible even to like our enemies. We are honest and faithful if the cost is not too high. We confess that too easily we accept the standards of this world and not those of Christ. We have settled for justice instead of caring concern and for fair play when you called us to love. We have exchanged 
what is right for what seems to work and what is true for what does not hurt. We allow the world to set the example instead of our Lord. Forgive us, Lord, that our striving against temptation is so weak and our struggle for what is right is so short-lived. Forgive us, renew and empower us to stand and to strive and to struggle for Christ and for the kingdom. Amen. And let's join in the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing now about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is justice and joy. Let's sing together. This is just the one hymn today, so make the most of it. The kingdom of God. The set gospel reading for this Sunday is um, continuing the, the teaching of Jesus. In recent weeks, the gospel reading from Matthew has been uh, about various parables. Uh, here we get uh, six for the price of one, uh, or um, possibly you might argue one of them's um, a metaphor rather than a parable. So five parables and a metaphor, but... We'll call it six. This is from Matthew chapter 13 and verses 31 to 33 and then um, 44 to 52. He told them another parable. 
The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 30 kilograms of flour until it worked all through the dough. And then moving to verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. Thanks be to God for his word. The difference between a parable and an illustration is that an illustration is usually something that accompanies a point that is made in plainer language. As a preacher, I'm used to using illustrations. I, I make a point and I explain it plainly, but I use an illustration either before or afterwards to, to try and help the listeners understand the point that I'm making and, and the illustration is, is intended for that one purpose. A parable may illustrate a particular point but it has a, a greater power especially when we're given uh, as we are in Matthew 13 uh, a, a series of parables without any context we don't get um, any plain language explanation of what Jesus is trying to say through these things. They are they're parables, they're stories. What do we make of them? And sometimes there may be an, an obvious conclusion to draw. Take, for example, the, the first of those parables, uh, the mustard seed, which is very small and it grows into a, a big tree or a very large bush at least. That says something about the kingdom of God. It shows that uh, the kingdom starts small, but gets bigger. It might not be much to look at at first, but it, it gets bigger, it grows. That may be the obvious um, interpretation of what Jesus is trying to say, but it's not the only interpretation. You could, for example, think of um, the, the seed growing as some... Uh, something representing hope, potential for the future. And the kingdom could be the person who plants the seed. The kingdom could represent uh, the place where hope is allowed to flourish, where small things are begun so that they have potential to grow into something bigger. Maybe it's the, the planting of the seed that is the, the key thing that Jesus was trying to get across. Or maybe it's the other end of the parable where the birds come and rest in the tree 
And maybe Jesus is saying the kingdom is the place where busy people fluttering around and uh, here and there and everywhere and never resting and they'll they'll come they'll come let's do the bird impression fluttering around they come and they settle and they rest in a tree well i don't have a tree but you get the idea they stop they rest that's the kingdom a place of rest and repose the point about parables is that sometimes there's, there's a lot of depth to them and we don't always get them just by putting the obvious meaning into plain language. We need wisdom, we need the spirit to help us understand them. And sometimes it's good to spend time reflecting on them and talking about them. And basically that's what I've been doing. I've looked at these parables, I've thought about them, and I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts. And I hope that the spirit will use my thoughts to encourage and inspire you. And maybe you'll see other things in these parables. If you think we're about to embark on a, a six-point sermon, don't panic too much because it's actually only going to be a three-point sermon. I've put these parables in pairs. Um, as I say, arguably only five parables and one metaphor, metaphor but I've put them in pairs anyway. Uh, and I've, I given sort of labels to each one. The first pair is about change. The second is about value. And the last pair uh, is about variety. And I realized there's two of those words begin with V. So then I, I went back and thought, well, is there another word for change uh, that also begins with V? Variation. So there we are. If you want a, a summary um, for, for this sermon, uh, in fact, let's, let's put it up. Here we are variation, uh, value, and variety. They're my three themes. Okay, now I did actually, when I'd finished preparing this sermon, think of a, another word beginning with V that doesn't quite fit so well as the first one, but it, it makes for a snappier uh, punchline to the, the sermon. So watch out for that. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you expectant for a the fourth V word that, that'll creep in at the end. But first of all, variation, change. The, the, the first two parables, that's the one about the mustard seed growing and about the woman working yeast into the dough. They're about things changing. They're about variation. The change in the mustard seed is a, a change in size. It, it grows, it starts small and it gets big. Growth, okay? The, the woman who works the yeast into the dough, it's not about growth so much as about spreading, permeating the dough. There is no more yeast at the end than there is at the start, but it's spread out. It, it's reached every part of the dough. That's different from the the mustard seed that is bigger, there's more of it at the end than at the start. Growth, permeation or spreading. Let me illustrate the difference in terms of how it might look in the kingdom. Hypothetical situation, say a, a town of 12,000 people and uh, 12 Christians move in. Uh, that's a nice biblical number for, uh, for the, the nucleus of uh, the work of the kingdom. Twelve members of the kingdom, the followers of Jesus, and they move into a town of 12,000. And let's imagine that they, they are very keen on evangelism. And they, they talk to people and they, they demonstrate God's love and they win people for Christ. And more people become Christians and over time, it's another 12 and then another uh, and a few dozen and several dozen and we get to a hundred and two hundred and three hundred and a thousand and three thousand and six thousand half the town who knows what might be possible but that's growth the, the kingdom starts small and more and more people become part of it but imagine another scenario that starts the same town of 12,000, 12 people move in and they concentrate on 
serving the community. They get involved. One of them becomes a, a volunteer in a local school and uh, reads to the children. Uh, one of them uh, becomes involved in local politics, becomes a local councillor. One of them concentrates on getting to know the people in the street where they live, identifying those who are lonely and visiting them. And then leading on from that, perhaps they, they set up uh, a system of, of visiting th those who are housebound or lonely. And th they set up a, a friendship scheme within the town and get other people involved. And over time, maybe the number of Christians in the town remains at 12, and yet their influence has spread. It's permeated the community. The, the impact they've had on that town is tremendous, punching far above their weight, as it were, so that everyone in the town knows at least one of these people in some capacity and knows that they are good people and they are Christians and they're working for the values of the kingdom. That's... Uh, permeation, spreading. Now, those are two extreme uh, situations, and uh, in reality, you wouldn't have either extreme. The kingdom does both. The kingdom grows in number, and it permeates and spreads. Jesus used both parables. But that's our role within society, within the church. Some people are better at evangelism and winning others for Christ. Some are, are more suited to service and, and getting involved and spreading the Christian influence out there into the community. But both are ways in which the kingdom changes things. Things don't just stay the same as they are forever and ever. They change and it's uh, when the spirit is working through kingdom people that the kingdom grows and spreads. So that's variation. We then get two more parables, uh, and these seem very similar. One is about a man finding treasure in a field and buying the field. The other is about a merchant finding a, a precious pearl and buying that. And in both cases, they sell all they have in order to, to purchase the, the particular object in question that they're giving up everything for the sake of the field or the pearl. But there is a difference in those two stories. The man who finds treasure hidden in the field, or buried in a field, he, he rehides it, he, he doesn't dig it up, he, he buries it again. And then he goes off to buy the field. Because whereas other people think they know the value of the field, I don't know, £2,000. I don't know how much of an average field is worth. They think it's worth £2,000. Um, but the man who knows that there's treasure hidden in there, he knows it's worth a lot more. It's worth £100,000 because of the value of the treasure. So if he can buy it for 2000 he's laughing. He's making a huge profit. He can only do that by giving up everything. He can't afford the 2,000. He needs to sell everything he's got in order to buy the field, but he makes this huge profit. The, the value increases. So that story is about someone making a profit to his own benefit. The story of the merchant and the pearl, there's nothing quite like uh, hidden information there. The pearl is a valuable pearl. And the merchant seems to want it simply because it is a, a thing of great value, a thing of great beauty. He, he appreciates pearls. That's, you know, that's what he does. He, he's a merchant. He appreciates good quality things. And here's a pearl that is so wonderful, so perfect, so amazing that he just has to have it. Not to make a profit, he, he pays its full value, what it actually costs, again, having to sell everything to do so, but he, he values it for its own sake. The pearl is valuable. It's not for the, the profit it gives him, but just owning it uh, is something that delights him. There's a difference between the two stories, although similarities. 
And again, let me illustrate this with um, the question, why do we come to worship in church? Or I should say, go to worship in church, in the case of those of you watching this at home who may do that sometimes, maybe you're not able to, but put yourself in the position of someone who goes to church on a Sunday. Why do you do that? Is it for what you get out of the service? Or is it to worship God? Is it for your own benefit or for God's benefit? And short answer, it could be for both in an ideal world. When you go to church, you are hoping to get something from it. And I would hope it's something more than just a nice chat with your friends and a bit of company, getting out of the house, going somewhere different. I hope it's more than just um, being entertained by the preacher, uh, hearing a few jokes, the preacher making you laugh, or enjoying a good sing and, and uh, you know, letting it with some lusty and favourite uh, rousing hymns. I hope it's more than that. I hope it's about becoming a better Christian, drawing closer to God, being challenged, being comforted, but, but getting something from the, the service of worship that, that changes your life. That may well be one reason you go, what, what profit are you going to get from it? But sometimes you may go to a church or a particular service where the preacher is boring or they mumble and you can't tell what they're saying. And so they may be saying the most profound thing in the world, but you can't hear it. Where the choice of music is not your style, either too traditional or too modern. Uh, you don't know the hymns. Uh, the prayers are long and rambling and the whole thing's tedious and the people aren't even friendly. And you know the whole experience is, is not a good one. You come away thinking, what did I get out of that? Nothing. But you can say, well, that's not the point anyway. I go to worship God. If God is present, which he always is, then I can worship God. I can find something, even in unfamiliar hymns, that, that will spark some sense of worship. Even if I don't know the tune, I could read the words and use them as a prayer. Or if I don't like the words, let them prompt me to my own words of prayer, just in my head. If I can't hear what the, the preacher's saying, well, um, read the Bible. Uh, I, I, I once had um, a retired minister in one of my uh, services who was there regularly. And more than once, he, he, he was very deaf, he really struggled. More than once, uh, he, he said to me, I've no idea what you're saying in your sermon, I can't hear you despite the fact we had microphones, loud voice, etc. Not my fault, it was his, you know, his hearing. He says, I, I can't hear you, but I sit there and imagine that you're preaching a really wonderful sermon. So in his imagination, my sermons were probably a lot better than they were in reality. But he was there to worship God. If he, if he couldn't hear me, he, he made his own sermon up and he worshipped God. That's why we're there, we're there to, to worship our Lord and our Saviour, the, the creator of the world. It doesn't matter the quality of the worship. It doesn't matter if we don't get anything out of it. We are there to give our worship to God. Now, those are the two extremes, but an ideal service of worship ought to have both. You ought to be able to get something from it, but you ought to have that opportunity to worship God. This is the contrast between the giving everything for, for your own profit, for your own benefit, like the man buying the field with the hidden treasure, or gaining or giving everything to gain something just because of its beauty, its value, the pearl. When we give everything to God, it does profit us. Someone came to Jesus saying, what must I do to, to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him, um, keep the commandments and when he said I've done that he said well sell everything give it to the poor then you come and follow me that's the way to eternal life that's the way you benefit give everything up you'll benefit 
the disciples uh, on one occasion when he was talking about money said, uh, what about us? We've given up everything to follow you. And Jesus's response was, don't worry, you'll get your reward. You won't lose out. Uh, there is profit to be had, not financial profit. I'm not preaching the, the kind of gospel you get in some places that give the church your money and God will repay you tenfold and you'll get even more money. No, no, no. The, the, the profit you get, the benefit you get from giving everything to God uh, is, is joy and peace and love and the kingdom qualities um, and, and a life which is a, a full Christian life leading to eternal life. It's, it's those benefits that you get. Nothing wrong with getting those benefits. But even if we didn't have those, God is worth our worship. He's worth following. Jesus is our saviour and our Lord. That's precious. That's beautiful. It's wonderful. Let's give ourselves in service to him. So value. I think I've talked enough about value, uh, those middle two parables. Turning to the last two, these two are about variety. There was a, the parable of um, the fishermen who, that caught all kinds of different fish in their net, um, some good, some bad, a variety. And then at the end, uh, actually, there's a, there's a little bit in between where Jesus says, do you understand this? And they answer yes. And I, I'd love to know how they answered that. Did, did they answer it with a, a positive yes? Uh, do you understand this? Yes, Jesus. Yes, we, we, we get it. Or was it more hesitant? Do you understand all this? Yes, we're getting there. Or I, I can't help thinking it may well have been uh, a yes that really means no. They were just giving Jesus the answer he wanted to hear. You know, he says, do you understand all this? Yes. No, I don't really. I haven't a clue what he's talking about. Did you get it? No, did you get it? Yes, Jesus. Yes, we, we, we're with you. I'd love to know whether they really understood. But moving on from that, we get to this metaphor at the end. Uh, the, 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 the householder taking out of his treasure store treasures old and new. Again, variety old and new two things about variety but quite different because in one case it's the good and the bad not all is good in the kingdom of god it's not a case that anything goes doesn't matter whatever you do that's okay anything goes no there's good there's bad and we don't want the bad as part of the kingdom. That's thrown out, got rid of, get rid of it. In the case of the, the treasure room, it's all good. It's all treasure, whether it's old or new. It's variety, like, um, you know, music. I mean, I, I like all kinds of music. And when I say music, I, of course, mean prog rock. But I like all kinds. I like the old stuff, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, top band. Um, you know, Genesis, Pink Floyd, Yes, Camel, all, all that stuff. But I like the new stuff as well. Spock's Beard and uh, The Tangent and uh, Magenta and, and uh, Unitopia. Lots of good stuff. Uh, so all kinds of music, old and new. Variety. The world is, is full of a rich variety. And sometimes... We need to distinguish between the good and the bad. And sometimes we need to embrace the fact that it's all good. It's part of the cultural diversity. It's possible to be a Christian in all kinds of settings. You can go to different countries that have a very different culture and their worship and their way of following Christ might be very different to ours, but it's still part of the kingdom, even within our own country. Uh, there are there are subcultures that the culture of those who are elderly or recently retired but still quite physically active is very different from the culture of today's teenagers, and the two cultures maybe shake their heads heads at each other and just haven't a clue how to understand each other. But both can be part of the kingdom. 
the kingdom is, is wide and varied. And what is simply cultural variation and diversity and what is right and wrong isn't always clear. And over time, it's changed. For example, slavery. When Paul wrote his letters, he wrote to masters and slaves. He recognised that there was diversity there. All one in Jesus, slave or free, you're all one in Jesus. But masters, you've got your job to do, and that is to treat your slaves well. Slaves, you've got your job to do, which is to obey your masters and behave properly. But Paul never dreamt that there was anything really wrong with that. That was just the way things were. We would say, hang on a minute, slavery is a bad thing. It's not just an acceptable uh, difference of, of culture. It's, it's bad. We don't want it. It's part of the good fish and bad fish. and uh, It's a bad fish. Get rid of it. Things have changed since Paul's time, and they've changed the other way as well. It's not that long ago, thinking in terms of marriage, relationships, sexuality. Um, it's only a few generations ago that two people living together outside marriage would be called living in sin. That um, a woman who gave birth to a child outside marriage would be not just frowned on, but almost an outcast from society. And that people who were known to have homosexual feelings were treated abominably. I can't say more than that. You know what I mean. Not that long ago. Today, society um, has a much more tolerant view of, of this diverse community. It, it's uh, unusual these days to find people getting married who have not already lived together. Single mothers, single parents, we find them all over. And we accept the, uh, that the LGBT community have, have a right to uh, live their lives in, in a different way to what others may feel is, is right and proper. It's part of this cultural diversity. So society says, the church is still wrestling with that and some people in the church are happy to go with this is just cultural diversity and others are still saying, well, we're not sure about that. Isn't this a right and wrong? This is where wisdom comes in. This is where it isn't easy uh, to, to, to separate. And the only encouragement I can give here is that in the parable of the net, the, the fishermen who sought out the uh, good and the bad are likened by Jesus to the angels sorting out the good and bad. In other words, not our job to do that. It's God's job. He's got his angels. He'll sort it out. What's good, what's bad, let him sort it out. Our job in the meantime is to love people, to show Christ's love and compassion to, to all that we meet. Um, do that and we can't go wrong. So there we are, variety. The kingdom of God um, is something that is, is, is a wonderful kingdom. And these parables just give us little insights in it. But the challenge to us is to give up all that we have so that we can be part of that vast and varied kingdom. And there's the other V word, vast. It's a huge kingdom. Going back to the mustard seed, grows big. So challenge to you, how much are you committed to God's kingdom? How much do you really care about God? How much do you really want to live your whole life for the sake of the kingdom? Because that's the way to do it. That's the way to, to get life in all its fullness. Commit yourself to Christ. Put your whole life in his hands and become part of what is a, a vast and valuable and varied kingdom. Amen.
Let's close with a, a short prayer and then a blessing. Lord God, help us to live the life of your kingdom. Help us to care for all those we meet. Help us to show your love. And we pray that your love will reach out to those who are struggling with poor health, that your peace will spread across the world, putting an end to hatred and to violence, that your justice will, will completely overwhelm the nations so that all is done rightly and well. Lord, inspire us, inspire our leaders, help those in need, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And as the sun struggles to come out once more and turn me bright, or not, yeah, there we go, may the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with you now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>